What really, I think, clicked for me with them was when they said, building the machine, the robot's the easy part. It's the food part that's the hard part. And I was like, the food part for me is the easy part. Like, the robot's the hard part. Like, you guys are crazy. And I was like, I think this is going to work. <laughs> this is Eric Minnick. He's a chef working for a company that's creating a fully autonomous restaurant. He's like a regular chef, but instead of preparing food that's given to a server who brings it to your table, Eric's food gets loaded into what is essentially a robot vending machine. As foreign as it is for me to try and comprehend a robot, it's as equally as foreign for them to try and understand like what goes into like a menu development and like cost structure and like sourcing ingredients and all this other kind of stuff, which for me, you know, being a chef is just like an average day, right? And then for them, the average day is making robots. That's just what they would be doing anyway. <laughs> Automation has long been embraced by sectors like the automotive industry. While the food services industry has traditionally been slow to adapt to new technology, rising costs, labor shortages, and a global pandemic have brought a need for new solutions, like QR code menus, automated kiosks, and now robotics. Once again, technology is changing work as we know it. Are you ready? These are the blue, white, and no-collar jobs of today and the future. Hey, Todd. Hey, Eddie. Dude, the robot's here. Robot is here. When I started at Mesley, we had no way of accounting, we had no way of inventory tracking, we had no recipes, we had no recipe books, like we had nothing, like literally starting from nothing. And when you're making a robot, there isn't really anybody else with the same experience, right? And so I can't just like uh, reach out and call my old chef and be like, hey, how would you properly extrude, you know, rice out of this thing, you know? <laughs> but um, we got pretty much everything in place now. Eric and his team design and prepare food in a traditional kitchen that is then loaded into a robotic system inside a shipping container. When a customer places an order, a bowl moves down a conveyor belt where different ingredients are added until the meal pops out of a delivery window. Eric and Eddie's job of designing meals that are then served in an automated system presents unique challenges. We have to think about how the robot is gonna, you know, assemble this food, grab this food, cook it for us. So we have to keep that in consideration. Some of the things we purposely undercook, some of the things we purposely like take a little too far. It really makes you think about different ways of creating food and executing that type of food. The balance between making good food and making sure it works for the robot. You know, I would say that balance is skewed on the food side for sure. So if we need to, you know, make something thinner, okay, well, does that, how does that affect the flavor of the sauce, for instance, if it's a little thinner? Does it make it worse? If it makes it worse, then we're not doing it. But can we make it thinner and make it better? Okay, well, we can do that. Well, let's do that. Or let's make a new sauce, right? So there's a balance, but uh, it's always flavor focused first. Because less labor is required, restaurants that utilize robotic systems could offer lower prices in the long run. But the benefits are not just for consumers. Robotics and automation are seen as a potential solution to some of the growing problems in the food industry. There's a lot of problems that have just naturally evolved in restaurants over just time. You know, cost of living is a big thing. Inflation is a big thing. Wages for a lot of cooks have always been, you know, minimum wage, maybe a little bit more if you're lucky. And all those things combined create for a pretty nasty staffing shortage. And that takes a toll, you know? You can't really get a solid footing as a restaurant if you're constantly hiring, constantly turning over staff. It's draining, you know, it's really exhausting. This kind of robot is built to do the types of jobs that have become increasingly difficult to hire for like dishwashers, servers, and prep cooks. In Eric and Eddie's case, it's allowed them to be paid more while working more traditional nine to five hours. Mesley's not gonna solve all the problems, but there's a couple things that Mesley as a model could help solve for. You know, better quality of life for the staff, more approachable hours or manageable hours, and just not that hectic hustle and bustle and grind robot, the only thing is, is it full or is it not? And what does it need? And, you know, as long as we're always prepared, we can always meet that. So, believe it or not, uh, my free time, I actually like to cook for myself and my wife. Because when I was working in restaurants, I never had time to. 
you know, the, there's the creative aspects where you're working with your hands and you're creating, you know, new things that not only can you look at and they're pretty, but you can eat them and they're also equally delicious. Robots are beginning to enter our restaurants. This technology is relatively new, but already showcasing the types of repetitive tasks that can be reduced by automation. Despite these developments, there are some things that, for the foreseeable future, will still require a human touch. There's a few things robots can't do that people, even myself included, will still want, right? We still want to have those, those date nights and those, those birthday dinners and get together with the friends at the bar and talk to the bartender, right? Um, so ro robots won't ever really have that human touch in the sense they won't have that true hospitality and like the true sense of the word. The impact robots will have on jobs and food services, especially in the near term, is unknown. But Eric's is an example of the many types of new jobs being created by the latest breakthroughs in technology. 